From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Inside Politics from Please Explain. I'm Jackie Maley. It's Friday, May 12th. Before the budget was handed down earlier this week, Katie Gallagher, the Minister for Finance, Women and the Public Service, tweeted that Labor is, quote, backing Australian women with the most significant single-year investment in women's equality in at least the last 40 years. Gallagher said that's because equality for women isn't an add-on or a nice-to-have, that it's crucial for our prosperity. But what exactly has Labor promised women? And were they really the winners in this year's budget? And... Tonight, Mr Speaker, I am proud to announce, as a centrepiece of this budget, our Labor government will triple the bulk billing incentive. While the government has put billions of dollars into bulk billing, which many GPs claim they can no longer afford to do, there is no guarantee that doctors will cooperate with the government's plans was the surprise measure of the budget, boosting Medicare funding to encourage more GPs to bulk bill more patients by increasing financial incentives. But while the government promises that millions of Australians will benefit, doctors are divided over what difference it will make. Is there any way the government can police bulk billing? And what are doctors saying about this budget measure? Today, Chief Political Correspondent David Crow and Economics Correspondent Rachel Clun join me to discuss the week in politics. Welcome to the podcast, Rachel and David. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. First, I just want to ask a broad question. Your very top line thoughts, was this a good budget for women? David? I think it was. I think generally it's been a pretty good budget. It's copped a lot of criticism from economists, for instance, who worry about inflation, various interest groups who believe that there should have been more for job seeker recipients and for people who are out of work. But on the whole, they got a fairly good balance between restraint on outlays and spending on people who needed that help, including, I think really importantly, uh, people over 55 who are on job seeker, and there's a lot of women in that category who will now get more per fortnight, and also the single parents who were clobbered by Labor in 2012, and that includes you know, mainly single mums, and that they now get more support as their children get older, uh, up until the children turns 14. Those are just two examples of measures where women benefit, but also where they've got the balance right, I think, in terms of restraint and expenditure. I think the budget was good for vulnerable women in particular. I think broadly it's not it's not a bad budget for women, but particularly for those women, as David said, you know, who are on the single parenting payment or um, who are older and out of work, those those women particularly um, saw some benefits on Tuesday. Yeah. We should also mention that the PPL, the paid parental leave um, entitlements were expanded. Obviously, that was announced a while ago, but I think it actually comes into being on July the 1st of this year. So it was in the budget. Before we get into the specifics of what they're offering a little bit more, I just want to talk about some of the messaging that the government had in the lead up to the budget around women and the economy and why they were saying they were trying to frame what they wanted to do for women very much in terms of economic benefit. David, what message were they trying to get across there? Workforce participation, I think, was a big theme that they were thinking about. There's been a um, concern within the government about labour shortages and about the fact also, I think, that they know that voters can see that we need more workers. And so, Everything, I think, ultimately comes down to improving the quality of the workforce, fixing labour shortages. And when that sort of crosses over with policies on women in the budget, the big theme is sort of giving women a fair go, women empowerment, women's participation in the economy so that they have as many opportunities as the men. Paid parental leave being an example of that, but also the income support is being positioned as something where they know that women can struggle to get work. If they've got a better safety net there with income support, it does give them more options to seek work. So they don't see it as a policy that helps women stay out of the workforce. They see it very much as a policy that encourages women into the workforce. Right. That's the sort of language that the government's been using, isn't it? They talk about these measures being an investment 
in the economy and investment in women as opposed to sort of a handout, if you will. Exactly. And when you look at them as a whole, I guess you can see how that argument comes together. You know, on on the single parenting payment, for instance, one of the issues there is that if you're a single parent on that payment and these are mostly women, as David said. When your youngest child turned eight, you were kicked off that payment and put on Job Seeker, which is about $180 a fortnight less. The other issue with the difference between those two payments is you can earn less on Job Seeker before you start losing that payment. And I was talking uh, recently with an advocate, Therese Edwards, who was saying that the real benefit of the higher single parenting payment is that women with children can earn a bit more before they start to lose that payment and also before they're kicked off it. So they've just got that safety net to fall back on if their casual work or their gig work kind of, you know, it it goes away. One of the other big things in their last budget was the expansion of the childcare subsidy and that kicks in from July 1 this year as well. So those two things combined kind of really paint that picture of trying to get more women into work or at least to do more hours of work if that's what they want to do really. Yeah, I'm glad you clarified that about the single parenting payment because I think that gets lost a little bit in the debate. And on that particular question, David, the Liberal Senator Amanda Stoker made a comment about the single parent payment extension. She said it's sit down money and that, you know, I guess she's implying there that it provides a disincentive for that cohort of women to work. What did you make of those comments and is this a sort of indicator that the coalition's not going to support that measure? That kind of comment kind of falls into the uh, trope that's around about women on these kind of payments that single mums just want to stay at home and not do anything. And I think the facts show that many of the women who are receiving that payment are working and they could work more if their economic conditions made it possible for them to you know, pay the cost of travelling to work and so forth. I don't know whether it means that they'll block it. Amanda Stoker is an interesting person as a former senator who's now in the running possibly to, to go for a lower house seat, but is at the moment a Sky News commentator. And so I think that's a play to the right. It sort of fits into a conservative template, ticks the boxes on, you know, uh, picking up on old stereotypes, but I don't know whether it's reflecting a view at the moment in the coalition party room about whether they oppose it or not. She does have a reputation, I suppose, for being a bit further right, as you say. And I think she was also, if she wasn't Minister for Women, she was an Assistant Minister for Women, mm, I think, in was. the previous government. Rachel, just turning now to what more the government might have done and some disappointments that there might have been in there, was there anywhere that, where they could have gone further, particularly for women in this budget? Well, Jack, you mentioned paid parental leave before and, you know, one of the things with that is that we're not going to get the full 26 weeks of government paid parental leave until 2026. So someone who's pregnant today is not going to get access to that full six months of leave. The other really interesting thing there is the government currently doesn't pay superannuation on their parental leave. If you work for a big company, your company will probably pay super on their scheme and maybe the government scheme as well. But most people don't have access to either of those options, to be honest. So that leaves women a bit worse off in retirement because they're missing out on that parental leave. And it wouldn't cost the government too much, but they've said repeatedly to me publicly and privately that that's really an issue for the next election and they're not looking at it at the moment. David, we keep hearing that the budget was all about a balancing act for the Labor government and that there was pressure to relieve the cost of living crisis without heightening inflation. Is there any argument that any of the measures, particularly the ones supporting women, will add to inflation? Yes, there's a broader debate about the weight of spending overall in total and the impact on inflation. That's a huge debate. It's got a lot of aspects to it and it's going to be fundamental, not just to economic policy, but also to the next election. It's fundamental Mm. politically. Now, I'm not saying that, say, $1.9 billion for single parents, most of them women, is going to push inflation. It's not. You could look at any individual measure and say, well, look, that's not inflationary. It's a drop in the ocean. I think that's really fundamental to start with. However, there is this argument about the total value of spending over the next financial year when inflation was 7% in the March quarter and the government wants to get it to 3.25% by June of next year. If the government doesn't reach that forecast, they're in a world of political pain And if they don't get inflation down between now and the next election, they'll be clobbered for it. Mm -hmm. So those who want 
and increase in payments have to think carefully about what they want here. Yes, it's possible to pour a lot of money into a lot of payments that go through to households that then could have an impact on demand. The way to fund that is to soak other parts of the economy, for instance, by changing the stage three tax cuts, imposing higher taxes on wealthier Australians. Yes, that's a way to do it. But here you've got a a really difficult scenario. Either Labor is clobbered at the next election for not doing enough on inflation, or they would be clobbered for breaking election promises on tax, for instance, by changing the stage three tax cuts this time, right now, before they take any new policy to the next election. So it's hard to see a way in which there would have been more generous payments here without an even more incendiary debate about inflation and even more policy pain for the government, but also political pain for Labor at the next election. Mm. I think David just touched on a you know point I've been discussing with a lot of economists in that you know the actual dollar figure on some of these measures to help with cost of living for women and for vulnerable people isn't huge but the fact that the government has added a bit to spending rather than pulling back its overall spending in the budget is a bit of a problem for the underlying structure of the budget and really government spending as a whole needs to come down if they want to not add to inflation. So like the general consensus is that the measures aren't inflationary, they're not disinflationary, but if the government really wanted to do something here, they needed to wind back more of their spending. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, they're still pumping billions and billions and billions of dollars into the economy, whichever way you cut it. Just finally, female voting blocs were crucial to securing Labor's victory at the last election. How do you think they will receive this budget? We've got our Resolve Political Monitor in the field at the moment. We'll know early next week what the verdict is from voters and whether they feel that whether the budget is good for them, their households, but also whether it's good for the country. These are the sort of fundamental tests. Treasurer Jim Chalmers has been asked about whether he expects to get a budget bounce in the polls. And I think we need to be cautious there. He didn't sort of lend any weight to that, but I think fundamentally budget bounces are a bit illusory. However, I think there's enough here that shows that they're looking after some of the most vulnerable, that they'll get some credit for that. I think it's important though that some households don't get much. They may still get some help with the Medicare package, for instance, but there's no no direct payments to them. There's nothing like there was last year, for instance, when the budget before the election offered billions of dollars in measures like cutting fuel excise. Yeah. The coalition offered that and then they got voted out anyway. Yeah. So voters may well see beyond the immediate issue or whether there's a direct handout for them and look at the budget in total of, in terms of whether it's good for the country. Rach, the budget, the elusive budget bounce, much hoped for, rarely seen. Will we see it this time? Look, that's a really good question. The Treasurer had a really fine line to walk. You know, he was stuck between the rock of high inflation and the hard place of people, you know, in a real fix when it comes to their own personal budgets. Mm. And there was big calls to increase, you know, the job seeker payment, Commonwealth rent assistance, you know, for people who really are really struggling with, you know, rents, with high energy prices, all of those sorts of things. And they were just never going to make everyone perfectly happy here. So whether people accept that they've done enough to help those vulnerable people, whether people on the other side accept that, you know, this budget did enough on that without adding to inflation, it remains to be seen, but it's it's quite an interesting fine line. So the centrepiece of the budget was a boost to Medicare, $3.5 billion in incentives to GPs to bulk bill pensioners and other welfare recipients and young people. But this only works if GPs actually decide to cooperate and drop their gap fees. David, what are we hearing from doctors on whether or not they will play ball and improve their bulk billing rates in response to this? Well, the simple sort of response is that there's a city-country divide that's emerging In uh, rural areas, the doctors seem pretty keen on this because there's still bulk billing occurring in those parts of the country and that they think that the higher incentive will be helpful to what they offer their patients. More patients could go in and just get free 
healthcare, at the GP. In city areas where bulk billing is becoming less common, the feedback that we've seen from GPs is that this is not enough. It's not going to really make a difference to them because they're charging patients now. And I've seen this in Sydney GPs just talking to families, uh, family members. They've gone into the GP and somebody at the counter has said, I hope you understand we're moving to mixed billing. Mixed billing means we're no longer bulk billing. We're going to hit you with a gap fee. Oh, yeah. Um, And that's becoming more common. Our colleague, Natasia Chrysanthos, has done some really good work talking to GPs in the wake of the budget. And the feedback was the city GPs don't think they will offer more bulk billing. And I think that's a real problem for this measure, which seems to be a really good policy idea, but a lot depends on what the GPs do. Mm. Some people are getting whacked up to $50 when they go to their doctors in that gap fee. Senator Jackie Lambie was on radio on Thursday in her characteristic style saying that she will come for doctors who don't bulk bill. I want to see those people in Tasmania, those medical those medical centres in Tasmania, more of you offering, um, offering that out there to Tasmanians because, quite frankly, uh, there's no excuse anymore and I will be coming for you. Um, the AC, I'm just wondering what that might look like, yeah. Jackie Lambie. I'll just, I'll just... But the government can't actually rely on Jackie Lambie for compliance entirely. How will they police this, Rach? Can they police it? Look, I, I don't think they can really police it, to be honest. And I think the best they can hope for is that, you know, GP clinics, particularly in parts of the country, you know, like, say, the western suburbs of Sydney or out of Melbourne, who already offer bulk billing, continue to do so. I don't think we're going to see inner city clinics, you know, all of a sudden starting to offer those services if they don't already have them. I think the hope is that the decline of bulk billing slows because it has been on a decline. Mm. And particularly, you know, health services are extremely difficult to get if you live in remote and rural Australia. So I think the hope there is that those people who really struggle to get just the basic health needs, their health needs met, will be able to see a doctor for a bit cheaper. Yeah, it's an interesting inflection point. I wonder if we're seeing the end of free healthcare, which we've always traditionally had since the beginning of Medicare. Well, the the test is going to be whether they can sort of stall the fall in bulk billing rates. I mean, there Mm. there is actually a measure by which this policy can be judged in a year from now or by the next election. Have they they kept the percentage of bulk billing at least flat and maybe Mm. increased it? Who knows? I mean, yeah, that is yeah. the goal. But there's also other elements to the to the Medicare package. It's 5.7 billion in total, and there are many different parts of it. So, I think they've delivered on one part of their rhetoric that Medicare was broken. It needed significant repair, and that they think this is the best way to fix it. We should point out to listeners that this podcast is being recorded before the opposition's budget reply. So we don't know exactly what their lines of attack will be on the budget. But David, they're sharpening them up. Can you give us a preview of what their biggest criticisms or attack lines on the budget might be? Yes. The um, the budget replies traditionally 7.30 on Thursday night. And it then sets up the debate on the Friday and then into the subsequent week. Next week being the sales campaign for the budget. Albanese and Chalmers will probably go to GP clinics to talk about Medicare. All the signs are that Peter Dutton is attacking on three main points. He says the migration intake is too high. So he's building up this attack line on 1.5 million migrants over five years. It's true that that's the forecast number for migration in Australia over the next five years, 1.5 million people. It's been in the range of that in the past, obviously, before the pandemic. There are going to be big questions about what the government does to try and moderate that. Remember, it's only a forecast. It's not a target. It's not something that they say they want to achieve. They've actually got policies underway that could reduce that number. The other thing is housing. There wasn't a huge amount for housing in this budget. And I think that is an area where Peter Dutton can really um, tap into discontent. He Mm. can say, look, we want you to use your superannuation for housing, for instance. Mm. There'll be measures like that from the coalition to set up a contrast. The third thing is infrastructure. The government has really given itself more time to think about what it wants to do with infrastructure funding. So there wasn't a lot of money in this budget for infrastructure projects like freeways, railways. Peter Dutton is pointing to that as an example of a gap and trying to get into the discontent in society about commute times. Uh, So there's 
actually room for room to move here for the coalition and the opposition leader on sowing some unrest over this budget? Yeah, I think housing is going to be a big debate going forward. I mean, so many people are in some form of housing stress, whether they're locked into mortgages because their loan to value ratio is too high or they're paying exorbitant amounts in rent, which is, you know, a third of Australians are in the rental market. So that is going to be a really clear attack line. I think we're going to definitely, as David said, see something in the super for housing space, which they took to the election and lost that election, but they're going to keep continue that, I think. Um, and again, the, the migration thing. It is worth pointing out that their forecast in 2019 for net overseas migration was 1.3 million over five years. So, you know, just to contrast that they were already forecasting quite a lot of people coming to Australia. And those problems are inter- interconnected, right? Mm. You know, we, we need housing to house the people that move here. So we're going to see a lot in this space in the coming weeks and months. All right. So giddy up for the super wars and possibly the migration wars. Thank you both very much for coming in. I know it's been such a busy week for you both, so I really super appreciate it. Nothing like being locked up in a studio after being locked up for the budget, Jackie. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thanks, Jackie. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Chi Wong, with technical assistance from Debbie Harrington. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Jacqueline Maley. This is Inside Politics from Please Explain. Thank you for listening.